afternoon and welcome to the NIASP 2022 Legends in School Psychology series. Today, we are honored to have a conversation with the legendary Dr. Jack Naglieri. Dr. Naglieri is a prolific researcher and assessment author. With 25 books authored or co-authored, 296 articles, chapters, and other publications, three online scoring and report writers, and 55 tests developed. Yeah, pretty amazing. He has given literally thousands of presentations, keynote addresses, and invited talks. He has written briefs, he's provided guidance, and even testified as an expert witness uh, regarding assessment results and the use of cognitive testing. Dr. Naglieri has been to every NASP convention, presented, I should say, at every NASP convention since 1979, Jack, is it? 78. 78. Excuse Come on. Me. Since 1978. <laughs> Got to keep the record straight. While his main uh, professional focus has been within the area of cognitive processing, cognitive assessment, and his neurocognitive theory of intelligence, or PASS theory, Dr. Naglieri has always had a keen awareness of how tests are constructed, the content of test items, and most importantly, how instrument results are used to impact students. Instead of Dr. Naglieri providing a lecture regarding his career, we decided that a conversation would be more effective and talking about how pivotal moments in Dr. Naglieri's life has really helped to change the course of his career. I'll just jump in here and say, you decided. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I decided that a conversation would be better. We wanted to give you an insight into Jack's life. You will hear about his own upbringing. Yes, some of the struggles he had in school. The messages given to him throughout his schooling, including at college. And how these influenced the development of many of the tests that we use today. So we invite you to sit back, listen, and enjoy a glimpse into the legendary Dr. Jack Naglieri. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I, I do want to extend my thanks to you personally for the friendship and for all you've done to make this such a uh, fun event. But I also want to thank NIAS for the honor of providing me this award. Thanks so very much. It, it means a lot. As Even though I haven't lived in New York for so long, I've been a member of NIAS for a really long time. And I, I guess I come to Proudly every year anyway. But, uh, we certainly keep inviting them back. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it's really an honor. I'm very humbled by it. And uh, thank you all so very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And he has been a member of NIAS for decades. So for all of you out there, you know, uh, can consider uh, trying to match his uh, membership record there. Uh, so. All right. Well, listen, we're going to share uh, quite a bit about Dr. Naglieri's life. So we're going to kind of dive right in. Um, but, but Jack, we're, we're going to talk about these pivotal moments in your life. And you're going to hear me kind of refer to that a lot. Can you just share a little bit as, as we kind of start out? You know, what are pivotal moments to you? Kind of give them that, that definition for what pivotal moments are for you. I guess this goes back to a conversation that we had several years ago. And I've been reflecting on how sometimes you're going this way and something happens and then you go this way. And you know, kind of like the Robert Frost poem, two, two paths diverged in the wood. Well, really, that's what we're really talking about. How your life can change, can pivot on one sometimes very little thing. And that could make all the difference in what you do, what you accomplish, and um, could lead to a whole, just a whole different ex something than you never expected. It's probably the best way to put it. And, and, and the reason why I asked Jack to talk about that, and we want to focus on that, because I think we all have pivotal moments in our life. We all have things that happen to us. And kind of what direction it takes us, how we react to it, is really important. And, and, and Dr. Naglieri is correct. We have had lots of conversations about this and different pivotal moments in his life. And it, it, it really is fascinating to kind of hear how many of these events have changed his life. 
So you may not know, but Dr. Naglieri is a native Long Islander. He grew up here on Long Island. Massapequa. Oh. Shout out to Massapequa, born and raised here on, on Long Island. We got some photos of, of uh, Jack and his mom and dad there. You That's know, before I had the beard. <laughs> little, little, little Jackie there, First, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, kindergarten. And, and, you know, you may not be able to see it, but Jack was quite the prolific uh, fisherman there. He, he loved to fish. And you could see his catch there in the photo on the right. Uh, I, I didn't know if that was your bait or if that was uh, the by actual catch. By size uh, order. Catch, uh, see, I was very organized <laughs> even then. Oh, by size order. <laughs> so, Jackie, you, you, you do talk a lot about your upbringing, and, and you give a lot of credit um, to, to your parents um, and the messages that you received. Uh, you've talked about pivotal moments in, in your upbringing. Can, can you share just a little bit with, with our friends here uh, you know, about some of those pivotal moments growing up? It would be important to put this event in a greater context based upon generations. Because in the early 1900s, my grandparents came here from Italy. And I didn't really understand their history until I was working on my doctorate. And I was talking to my grandparents one day. And I was thinking, no, they don't understand what I'm doing. And um, I started to ask them about their history. Why did you come here? What did you do? What was it like? And then I realized they knew exactly what I was doing, but in a different way, because they made it really clear that they came here for the opportunity, and opportunity was related to education. I remember my grandma saying, I asked her, Mama, why did you come here? She says, ah, because in Italy we couldn't eat. You know, we couldn't eat. Think about that. We couldn't eat. Wow. And they all left everything. But they had a vision. The vision was to better yourself by hard work and education. And that's, that was a clear message. You know, you work hard, you do your very best. She used to say, you can be anything you want if you work hard enough. And, and, and you had to yeah. as, as a child. Yeah, I did. You might be surprised to know that my high school average was C+. Yeah, I was a bad reader. I had very bad reading instruction. It was very phonics-based. That wasn't something that I resonated to. I was trying to figure out how everything fit together. And I remember thinking, it doesn't make sense. Why does zoo and do, why aren't they both spelled the same way, right? And no one, none of my teachers told me, Jack, that's our language. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's messed up, man, you know? You got to learn the, all the, the almost rules and everything else. So yeah, so I, I got into college on a directed studies program at CW Post. And we'll, we'll, we're going to get into that. But, but one area that Jack found as a child that he really excelled in, well, maybe not accordion, but <laughs> he became a, an accomplished musician. Can you talk a little bit about music in your life yeah, and, and I, yeah. what that brought to you? It's really important, actually. Um, like John said, I wasn't an accordion player. My dad wanted to learn accordion, so that meant I had to take lessons. You know. But, you know, it didn't work for me. I just didn't like it, and uh, I, I totally failed at that intentionally because I hated it. <laughs> but Good I really wanted. Oppositional defiant kid. <laughs> hey, diagnosing you already? <laughs> no. uh, but I really I wanted to play the guitar, and Dad, he got me a guitar. And they never had to tell me to practice. I practiced, started playing when I was eight, and I practiced and practiced. And they learned a lot. There's my first band that I was in with Charlie and Bob. It was a great learning experience for me. I started teaching guitar when I was 16, playing professionally when I was 17 in places I was too young to be in. <laughs> Look at that handsome man. Oh, man. That's with my custom made guitar that my dad got me. We were pretty serious about 
playing because that's how I earned my way through school. Playing in every possible venue you can imagine, I've played it. From recording with 50-piece orchestra to playing by myself and singing in a bar, that's really scary. <laughs> yeah, and everything in between. But, but what I think is fascinating, and maybe if you can share just a little bit more, well, Jack shared that he struggled in school, and school was, was actually very difficult for him in many ways. And how many of us can relate to that, or the kids that we work with? The fact that you found this passion um, that, that became a, an advocation, that, that became something that you were actually able to help you survive <laughs> in many ways, you know, financially uh, survive. Talk just a little bit about that kind of transition from struggling how it made you feel, the messages that you heard from others, and then more how you felt playing that music. Now you have to remember, playing um, The Bride Cuts the Cake, The Bride Cuts the Cake, <laughs> how, you know, that's not really enriching. <laughs> uh, I studied jazz because I love jazz, right? But you don't get to play that too often, <laughs> right? But I learned a lot from teaching guitar. And what I learned was that I used the same lesson with, from the same book with every student. And some students really learn, and others don't. And it really intrigued me. Why is that? Why, why doesn't every student learn really well? That was really the beginnings of my interest in intelligence and cognitive processing and understand why some people really excel at certain things and others not, and myself included. Why didn't I learn to read very well? I understand it now. So you talk about pivotal moments, and, and while he probably didn't identify it at that time, you know, kind of realizing that, that kids learn differently and, and process information differently. But for you personally, it was transformative because it helped him to feel better about himself. And, and what I hear, when, when, when we've talked about this in the past, what I hear is the message of how we help kids discover their passions, how we help kids discover what's important to them, how they feel good. And I think that that story is so illustrative of that. Um, and so I you know, appreciate you sharing that. Not doing well in school can have a big impact on a person. Because we often think if you don't do well in school, it means you're not smart. And sometimes that message can be uh, communicated to you from other people. For example, the guidance counselor at my high school who said, you might be able to get into college if you find some school somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, because your grades aren't good. And then when I went to CW Post, they let me in, had to take extra remedial classes. They tested me, and I can still see the, 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 the person sitting behind her desk pulling out the file with my name on it saying, we have your scores. We think you might make it through college. <laughs> Graduated with honors. But, uh, and then I remember, so now think about it. I'm working a lot of nights, five nights a week sometimes playing the guitar, trying to get enough money, playing weddings, bar mitzvahs, playing everything you can imagine, while I'm going and taking a full course at post. And then went on to work, get to St. John's to get my master's, working as a school psychologist, and still working <laughs> in the, as a musician. And then when I applied for a PhD program, at the interview, very close to where we are right now, the director of the school psychology program said to me, we looked at your GRE score. The GR, we use the GRE as a measure of intelligence, as some people still do, and I've even seen articles recently in journals that have the same position. We don't think you're smart enough to get a PhD. I saw her at every NASP I've presented at.
<laughs> so l let's not lose the irony of the author of 55 tests, many of them cognitive assessments, um, who was told he's not smart enough to get a PhD. But, but let's not lose the larger point. And, and, and you know, Jack, I want to kind of dive into this just for a moment. Um, let's think about the work we do as school psychologists and how we use assessments and assessment results and the messages we give to the kids, to the parents. And, and Jack, I mean, you're, you're the author of, uh, of tests. And yet, as I said in the introduction, you have always had this keen awareness of how results are interpreted, how results are used. Can you share just a little bit of that based upon your experiences, but also your research? Yeah, thank you, John. So here's what I worry about. 1,250,000 students of color who are in K-12 right now who could have been in gifted because they're really smart, but they're not. And the reason they're not in gifted is because of the mindset and the methodologies that are used to identify gifted children. And on the other end of the distribution, we know that black children of color are overrepresented 150% at the other end of the distribution. The irony is we can do better, but the field is stuck in the past. And to get the people to move to something that works takes time and energy. But that's, that's been my goal since 19... 82 when I published my first paper on equity. <laughs> Think about that, 1982. When, just a year after I tested a young lady in Havasupai Village in Arizona who got a 52 on the Wexler verbal, you know, and a 97 on the nonverbal side. And my colleagues at the university said to me, well, that's because Native Americans needed really good spatial skills, so that's why the nonverbal stuff is right brain is good and, and not good verbally, so their left brains aren't as good. And I remember saying to them, that's the stupidest damn thing I ever heard. They don't speak <laughs> English. Just like my grandfather, you know? I, know. I don't speak any English, so he would have gotten those same scores. So that's, that's, my, that's been my focus, actually, since 1975 when I worked at Beth Page. And I first noticed that the intelligence test I was using had a lot of achievement in them. And I wondered, why would you describe how smart somebody is by a vocabulary score? Isn't that a reflection of your opportunity to learn? And how is that fair to kids who don't have that opportunity to learn? It's not, it's not even about fairness. It's, about, it's not even reasonable. But that's what we've done, and we accept it as right. And some people even say vocabulary is intelligence, and I completely reject that. We, we've had some good conversations. We often talk about equity um, and, and the importance of equity and the work that we do in general as, as school psychologists. Uh, we're certainly uh, much more mindful of our, our social justice lens uh, and, and the impact, you know, the work that we do. Um, and yet there's an important distinction, Jack, between test equity and test bias. Can, can, can you share just a little bit of what's the difference and why that matters? Yeah, that's a really great question, John. It's esoteric and, and practical at the same time. <laughs> so you might read in a test manual, the test been, has been subjected to analyses of the internal workings, you know, the psychometric dip analysis, vectorial invariance, blah, 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 blah. Test doesn't have any test bias. You can use it. But the standards for educational psychological tests say if a student has not had the opportunity to learn the content in the test, that test may be considered unfair. That's the 
That's the equity part. So bias and equity are both important, but when we are often told, you can use this test because it's not biased, that's not enough. And you need to know that. You, every, every person who uses the test that we've been told are good gold standards and so on. You know, you need to look in those manuals and see what's not there. All right? We often look and see what is there, but you have to look for what's not there. And when they don't show you differences between groups that a test yields, they're hiding. They're hiding the fact that it's not fair. It may not be biased, and that's good, but that's only half the story. We need the whole picture. Let's kind of back up just a moment, because we skipped over just a little bit of where some of this really um, developed for you. So Jack went to St. John's University, um, here local again, uh, uh, not, not, not for the doctoral program, for, for his master's at that time. We're, we're not naming the other doctoral program right now. Thank you, John. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that he told he couldn't, uh, couldn't finish, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into the doctoral program later on. So went to St. John's, and you had some pretty transformative moments at St. John's that really was pivotal um, in, in terms of your views as a school psychologist. Because again, Jack was a practicing school psychologist. So can you talk just a little bit about your time at, at, at St. John's? Yeah, when I think about the extraordinarily important person I had as a teacher, at St. John's, it's, it's almost surreal to see ultimately what happened. So at St. John's, I had already worked as a school psychologist, so I had some experience. And I had this teacher, and he was kind of quirky and different and brilliant. His name was John Carboy. And he taught us Luria in the 70s. <laughs> and I mean, this is when it was really hard to even get the information. You know, going to the library, trying to read Luria, and, and in fact, he, the, the, our, our uh, final exam for his course on the neuropsychology of learning disabilities, think about that in the 70s, the neuropsychology of learning disabilities. We had to, we had to be able to recite every part of the brain that a stimulus goes through from input to output from the, all the modalities. That, that was our, our final. And um, when I worked as a school psychologist later on, I remember thinking, I can't look into this kid's head. <laughs> but I really want to know cognitively what they can do. So that's why, for me, what John Carboy, Carboy talk, uh, taught us about Luria was understanding the thinking that underlies the learning. And the thinking is based on brain function. And it's that function, those four functional components that my colleague J.P. Das and I used to reimagine what intelligence could be and then to create a way to measure it because if you have a great theory but you can't measure it, it's not really very practical. And I'm a practical guy. I want to be able to help you tomorrow with that kid who has trouble with attention or planning or simultaneous or successive processing. And if I have a great theory but you can't measure it, then it's okay. It might be fun, but it's not functional. So how did that translate into the development of your past theory? So when I was at the University of Georgia, and Alan Kaufman said he was going to build a new intelligence test. He didn't have a vision of which theory. He talked of a, about a lot of different theories. And one of them was the Luria theory that J.P. Das had just published a book about. And I knew all about that. So when Alan said, does anyone want to help build a new test? I was like, I will. And I remember thinking, you don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever taught us how to make tests. No one. But I don't know what happened, but I'd come in with a couple of ideas every week. And Alan would say, well, where'd you get this? And I said, well, I was, you know, 
waiting for the bus, and I just got this idea. <laughs> and I went home and rendered it and come in with items and a whole subtest. And that went on for weeks after weeks after weeks. And a lot of the first KBC were things that I completely invented. And I remember the day when Alan came to me and said, I'm trying to find somebody to do a progressive matrices test. Would you do that? I said, sure. I didn't really have any idea what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at Raven's matrices, and I said to myself, it's pretty damn ugly. I eventually did a lot better than <laughs> Raven's did, at least graphically, you could say. You know? <laughs> but uh, no, that was how I got started. And then some years later, when I was teaching assessment, and I kept saying, well, this is really good, but it needs to be done better. And this is really good, but it needs to be redone better. I thought, I think I have to do that. <laughs> Did it for Kaufman's, could do it for me.